started, we're going to have a word of prayer and uh, probably get close to finishing up at least the material. Probably, I don't know if we'll get through it all today or next week. Um, then after that, for the remainder weeks of this class, uh, we're going to use it for practice. So we're going to get a lot of practice in. And you'll be practicing on each other and, you know, soul winning and, and, uh, and that stuff like that won't be, we won't record anything because that doesn't need to be recorded. No, there's no information. Uh, but it's like, we'll just take turns, you know, being lost and then someone else being a soul winner and try to give each other different scenarios. And the goal is not trying to stump somebody when we do that. The goal is trying to get real life situations, you know, that people will come across and then trying to learn and you're not going to do it perfectly and you know, it's going to be very awkward, but the more you do it, the more fluent you'll get with it, the more efficient you'll have the, the plan down. So let's pray and we'll get started here uh, with today's stuff. Father, we ask you to bless us now and pray that you will open our understanding uh, to the material and help all the classes, Lord, everything that we learn uh, to be pleasing in your sight. And Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We left off uh, at Roman number three. I mentioned last week uh, this was a transition uh, right here. This is where... You're going to actually lead them to Christ. There's two transitions in this thing. One transition is when, uh, after you've given your testimony, and you say, you know, if you die today, uh, how do you feel about that? If you die today, you know for sure you go to heaven. And they say, well, you know, I really don't know for sure. And then you say, can I take just a moment and show you how you can know for sure? You want to quickly move from there, that step three, into step four. That's a transition. And then we went through the four different verses that you're going to teach them. Um, they're all, everyone's a sinner. Uh, we all deserve hell in the lake of fire. Uh, Christ paid the price for our sins. And then whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're going to teach them each one of those things. We discussed how to do that. And now we're in a transition. You just taught them the last verse. And now you want to draw the net right. I think we maybe we, I gave you that blank at the top there. Room number three, draw the net right. Did I give you that? Yes, you did. Okay. So you're going to bow your head and you pray. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you these next few steps the way I was taught to do this. Now, I learned to do it this way, but I don't do it this way now. Okay. This is a good way to do it. But it didn't fit my personality. I did it this way for I don't know how many times. Uh, probably did it a year this way. Uh, and every time we'd go out, I mean, we were going out each week, and every time we'd go out, I, this is the method I would use so I could learn it. But it's like I told you, once you learn this, then you start incorporating your own stuff. So we just got started. Um, so in these next few steps, I'm going to tell you, it's probably going to be really awkward because it's probably not going to be like anything that you've heard before, but I'm telling you, this does work. I just don't use it this, I don't use this anymore, but I, I still think it's important to learn how to do it this way and get this down, practice it a little bit, and then you can get comfortable doing it your own way uh, after that. So. Step eight, you bow your head and you pray. So you just ask them, you're just teaching them Romans 10, 13, and then you just bow your head and pray. Now when you bow your head and pray, what are they probably going to do? Peek. Well, they're probably going to be like, oh. And they're going to bow their head and pray. Okay? That's what, that's a natural response. People bow their head and pray. They're talking to you. They're giving you their time. Bow your head and pray. They're going to bow their head and pray. And there, there's a reason that you're praying. Um, you pray for what you want. You want the person to understand the gospel and receive Christ. You want to thank God that these, uh, you're going to be thankful to God. You're going to say, Lord, thank you that these people were polite and gave you their time. 
Um, and then you're going to ask the Lord to help them to understand and get saved. That's why you're just praying. That's why you're going to pray here. And so this is step eight. So you just bow your head and pray and say, Dear Jesus, I pray that you will help uh, this person to understand the gospel and get saved. And I pray that you will, I uh, thank you that they were very polite and uh, they've opened up their home to me and they've been very courteous and I appreciate their openness now. But help them, Lord, to receive you as Savior. And then you're going to move into step nine. Step nine is you're going to ask him to pray. You're going to ask him to pray. Okay, now, at this point, you're going to lead him in a step-by-step -step prayer to receive Christ as Savior. Now, what if they say no at this point? And what you're going to do is you're going to say, now, would you like to pray and ask the Lord to save you? And, of course, you're, you can say something like this, and I've heard people do it this way. You know, with their heads bowed, uh, our heads still bowed. Would you like to receive Christ as your Savior? And they can tell you while they're praying, you know, while you're heading back, no. So what do you do? You're still praying. You pray that God will help them understand. Well, you just don't go, okay, amen, and you're done. There's some things that you need to do here at this point. Explain that you're not asking them to join anything or do anything, and then you want to ask them again. Because some people, when, they, when you ask them if they would like to pray to be saved, they think what they're hearing, you know, is not what you're saying. You're asking them just to pray and be saved. But they're hearing, oh man, I've got to start being faithful to church. I've got to go every week. Uh, I can't, my work schedule won't let me do that. I can't do this stuff. Uh, but sometimes they think, oh, I've got to give all my money to the church. I can't do that. Uh, sometimes they think, uh, you know, well, they're asking me to join a club. Or, I mean, there's all kinds of things that's going through their head. So you need to clarify with them that you're not asking them to join anything. You're not asking them to do anything. Um, but you just want to clarify what it is that you are asking. Uh, I'm just asking if you would like to pray and ask God to save you from your sins. Now, if they say no a second time, explain again, very briefly, just with thanksgiving. Why do we pray, if they say no three times that they don't want to ask God to save them, why would you pray for them with thanksgiving? Why do you think you would do that? Plan a seed. Okay, that's a good answer, plan a seed. I'm trying to, there's a specific verse I'm trying to get you to think of. What's the will of God, I guess? What's that thing? Okay. Uh, Actually, I'm not even sure what the reference is off the top of my head. Uh, I think it's in Galatians. Giving thanks for all things. Um, I don't have my phone to look it up. Blue Letter Bible. You might know what the reference is, but the Bible talks about uh, us. There's the one verse, and I think this might be the one you were thinking of, Andrew. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The verse I was thinking of, giving thanks always for all things. Uh, and then there's another verse talking about our prayers. Um, you let your request be made unto God, but it says there, with thanksgiving. Yeah, we need to let our request be made known to God. Um, so that's why we're going to pray for Thanksgiving. Because we want to thank God that God is working. At least they allowed you to go through this uh, the gospel with them. And then when, you, when they say no, then you're going to pray for them and you're going to thank the Lord again. And you're going to say something to the fact, you know, Lord, I thank you again that they had given me their time. And I'm praying for them that they will not put this off any longer, and that you will help them to make this decision soon. And you always pray for what you want. And that's kind of what you're doing here at step nine. Now, if they don't say no at this point, um, what you want to do, is you want to explain to them, so it's kind of like, uh, 
and I'm getting lost here in my notes, and I'm trying to follow you and see where you're at. I think you just have number nine and then number ten. You probably don't have anything in between there, do you? No. Okay. Um, so let's back up here a second. Number nine, you're going to ask him to pray, and you're going to lead him in a step-by-step -step prayer to receive Christ as Savior. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to explain to them, if Jesus will receive you right now, just as you are, and he will, will you receive him right now, just as he is? Now, is that in your notes? Okay, you might want to jot that down. Let me go over that again. If Jesus will receive you, if Jesus will receive you, Right now, if Jesus will receive you right now, just as you are, if Jesus will receive you right now, just as you are, and then in parentheses you want to put this, and he will.
So you're leading them in a step-by-step -step prayer. So they just prayed, and you just said, uh, help me to live my life. Uh, they said, help me to live my life to please you. And they repeated that, to please you. And then you're going to say, now remember, your heads are bowed and eyes are closed here. You're going to say, now with our heads still bowed, and then you're going to go to the next step. Now remember, step 8, 9, and 10, uh, step 8, 9, and 10, honestly, again, I don't usually use those. I learned to do it this way um, just until I could get practice, and then I tweaked it to my own personality. And that's what I'm asking you to do. Learn it this way and then tweak it to your own personality. And I think that would help you. So you're going to say now with our heads still bowed. And then in verse step 10, you're going to ask him. And this is where, it, for me, I'm not a touch. Okay? <laughs> I'm not a touchy person. And this is where it got a little weird. But it was effective. You're going to ask him to take your hand if he meant business. So it's kind of like a handshake, you know. Uh, now, they're going to be doing this right here, and you have. this is where you're probably going to have to be, okay? Because they're going to be going, their eyes are still closed. They're just reaching, trying to find your hand. So you're just looking for their hand. You might have to grab their arm and just take their hand like a handshake. And you're going to hold your hand in a handshake. And then there's a reason for this. Um, and that's your blank there. This is simply like a handshake. Now, I've seen it done this way where they've actually taken it. And some people are comfortable kind of holding hands like this when they're praying together. I'm not. I'm okay with the handshake. I feel okay with that. So that's the way I did it. And uh, so anyway. Um, now. <clears throat> Then, once you do that and you get their hand, you're going to go right into step 11. Step 11 is you are going to pray with thanksgiving, rejoicing, and assurance. Now, that seems very, very easy there. So, let me just refresh these, these few steps here. All right? You just gave them uh, the last step that they uh, need to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. That's, that's what you just covered right there. So then you're going to go ahead and bow your head and pray. And you're going to say, with your head bowed, you're going to say, Dear Jesus, I thank you that, uh, you know, Johnny so-and-so, you know, opened his home to me and he's been very polite and gave me his time. I thank you his heart's tender. And I'm praying, Lord, that right now you will ask uh, or you will help him to understand the gospel so he can ask you to save him so he can have a home in heaven. And then that's when you're going to go to the next step, and you're going to say, uh, now, use his first name. Now, Johnny, if Jesus will receive you right now just as you are, and he will, will you receive Jesus just as he is? And you're going to listen for an answer. And if they say yes, then that's when you're going to lead him in a step-by-step -step prayer. And you're going to say, well, just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, dear Lord Jesus, and you're going to repeat all that. And then once they repeat the prayer and go through that, you're going to say, now with our heads still bowed, and then say, would you uh, take my hand? And, of course, we're going to be looking for your hands, so make sure you, just, you take the hands. And then you're going to pray with thanksgiving and rejoicing and say, Lord, thank you so much that Johnny got saved. and He put his faith and trust in you. And, Lord, I pray that you will help him to grow strong in the faith. And, you know, close your prayer however you want to close it. That's, that's up to you how you want to pray but that's the way you're going to pray at the end of that. That's where you get into step 12. Step 12 is where you're going to start giving them assurance. Now, you'll probably have to see that a few times for it to start to click. Because what happens if, back in step 9, they tell you no. Well, let's review that. Let's go back to step 8 again. Step 7 was where you taught them, uh, whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. You went through all that. You explained whosoever it was. What call means, it means to pray. You've gone through all that. You bow your head to pray, and you pray, Lord Jesus, I pray that you will help Johnny uh, to understand the gospel, uh, give him the strength and courage that he needs to trust you as a Savior. And then you're going to ask him a question. You're going to say, now, uh, Johnny, if Jesus were, if uh, will you receive Jesus, I'm sorry, back to the, 
If Jesus will receive you just as you are, and he will, will you receive Jesus just as he is? And you're listening for an answer. And he tells you no. This is where you're going to go through those steps. You know, John, I want you to understand, I'm not asking you, and your head is still bad, your eyes are closed. I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm not asking you to belong to anything. Just asking you to receive Jesus. Would you be willing to do that? Well, I don't really think so. Now, remember, I'm not asking you to get baptized or anything. And But I would like to see you take this step. Would you be willing to do that? And if he tells you no again, then you pray. That's when you stop and say, well, I thank you so much. And thank you, Lord, that Johnny's given me his time and he's been very tenderhearted. And, and I pray that you will help him to receive Christ very soon um, so he doesn't die and go to hell or however you want to close the prayer. And that's where you're going to finish. And thank them for their time. And that's kind of the way the step is if they say no in those things. Now, sometimes you might feel like, well, you know, you're pressuring them. But all you're trying to do, if they tell you no, the reason you're doing three times is you want to try to say different things each time to remove any, uh, any obstacle that might be in the way in their own mind. Uh, again, sometimes they think they're asking to join a church. Sometimes they think they're asking you to leave their church, uh, you know, or leave. You're not asking them to do anything. You're just asking them to be saved. That's all you're asking. And that's what you're trying to clarify with them. Uh, because even though you say it, again, that's not what they're necessarily hearing. That's why you keep trying to go through it. And once you clarify it in a couple different ways, if they still tell you no, well, then it obviously wasn't God's timing for that. And you're not going to talk them into it. And we don't want to talk somebody into it. We want the Holy Spirit to do that. So you just thank the Lord for their time and thank you know, God for the opportunity you had to share the gospel with them. Now, if they do tell you yes, that's when uh, you're going to lead them in the such prayer, take your hand, and then you're going to pray with thanksgiving and rejoicing. And, then kind of, and the reason I always did a handshake for me it was natural because then it's like, you know, praise the Lord, I'm so excited for you. Now let me show you something else. And this is where you're going to go into step 12 uh, because remember... These first 11 steps, you try to go very quickly. You might have taken three or four minutes of their time to get to this point. Um, now, if they wanted to sit down and talk in a living room, and you know, you're know you sitting there chatting for 15, 20 minutes going through this, that's fine. But you have to be sensitive to other people's time. If you feel like, if you're getting the sense that they're you know, urgent, or maybe they're, they were getting ready to come out the door, you know, the woman, she has a, her purse and her keys, well, obviously, she's getting ready to go somewhere. So you want to be as quick as possible. But if she's still giving you her time, she probably wasn't in a big, big hurry. But just move as quickly as you can. You want to be courteous to people. Always be polite and considerate of their time. And if I ever stop, sometimes when somebody's out mowing, you know, I'll stop them. And if they stop and want to talk, they shut the mower off and want to talk, then I'll talk to them a little. But otherwise, I'll just like, you know, hold up a track. Can I leave this with you? You know, if they don't shut the motor, they probably don't want to stop what they're doing. So be considerate of their time and just leave a gospel track with them. That's, that's all it is. Does that make sense, everybody? Mm -hmm. um, all right. So let's say they've received Christ as their Savior. You've prayed with thanksgiving and rejoicing. <clears throat> um, and now you get into room number four, how to keep what you catch. How to keep what you catch. And let me stress again here, step 8, 9, and 10 are probably going to feel a little awkward because you've probably never done it that way before. It was for me. Uh, it still is for me because I just don't usually do it that way. It works. It's very efficient. Um, and it's, it's biblical. I mean, you're praying for what you want. You want them to receive Christ. But you're also not pressuring them into anything. You're leaving the decision up to them whether they want to receive Christ as Savior or not. But for me, I just kind of tweaked it a little bit to fit more my personality. All right. So step uh, 12, this is how you keep what you catch. Oftentimes we think about soul winning, uh, winning somebody to Christ. We think about the witnessing part, but then we just leave it there. We don't do anything else. But remember, it is our responsibility. It's our personal responsibility to make sure we disciple people. So, you want to give uh, this person assurance of their salvation. So that's your blank, salvation. Give him assurance of salvation. 
Spend as much time here as you can. So you're going to go back and teach again Romans 10, 13. Because remember, you just covered that, so you don't have to spend a lot of time here. And what is Romans 10, 13? That's right. All of you need to spit that out. For whose service shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so you're just going to emphasize now. I'm going to just use the name Johnny. Johnny, now, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who's that talking about? Well, me, everybody. Did you just call on the name of the Lord? Yeah. So what does that verse say? You shall be what? Saved. So you just keep, you just see how quickly that was? Boom, boom, boom. Just real fast. You don't have to spend a lot of time there. Um, you can also ask him here, this is a good idea, ask him if he is good at memory work. Then ask him to memorize that. You might, if you have a gospel track, that verse is in there. And I've even, I'll even mark it here and say, are you good at memory work? And could you, and of course they say, no, I'm horrible at memory work. You know, join the crowd. It takes me a lot of effort and energy and, you know, to really try to memorize something. But do you think you could work on trying to memorize this for whose service shall fall upon him or shall be saved? Do you think you could get those few words right there? And just work on that this week. And you're going to mark it for them so they can do that. And again, uh, <clears throat> you want to make sure, let me just go over this again. When you're teaching them about Romans 10, 13, ask them who the whosoever is. Teach them that call is praying to God. Teach them that shall is the strongest word that can be used. And then ask him, shall what? And then, of course, he should see, be saved. So, here's what you want to say. According to the Bible, because it doesn't matter what our opinion is, according to the Bible, are you saved or lost? And you let them answer. According to the Bible, are you saved or lost? And they should say, well, saved. And that's the right answer. And why are they saved? Because they called, they did what the Bible said, they called upon the name of the Lord. Now, you're going to come across people here when you ask that question. According to the Bible, are you saved or lost? And guess what you're going to hear a lot of times? Lost. So this is where you kind of smack upside the head. <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> now this is where the reason they think that is because, remember, they, they've been in a life of sin. You know, they, they've been dealing with a lot of sin. They probably have some sinful habits. And they know these things aren't going to just stop all of a sudden. So that's why they're still going to think they're lost. Okay? So that's, that's the type of stuff you have to deal with here. Um, sometimes people think that they're lost because they didn't experience anything. They didn't see an angel come out of heaven. And, you know, they didn't see some bird come down and land on your shoulder as you were talking to them. Uh, I mean, some people think crazy things what salvation is. And that because they didn't experience something, they're going to think they're still lost too. So you have to kind of address some of these things. So what you want to do is you want to simply reassure them that if they did what the Bible said and they really meant it. Because isn't that what Romans 10, 9 says? That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart. So if they really meant it, then according to the authority of the word of God, they're saved. It doesn't matter how they feel. It's according to the word of God, they're saved. So then you want to ask, where do saved people go? Because all you're trying to do is reassure them of their salvation. You're not going to leave them hanging here. Where do saved people go? And then, of course, they're going to say, well, heaven. You can also ask, according to the Bible, if you were to die right now, where would you go? According to the Bible. And then you're going to start to see the bells kind of clicking. Like, oh, I see. I did what the Bible said I needed to do. So that means I'm saved. And saved people go to heaven. So if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. You see, they're going to, it's going to start to click here for them a little bit. Um, and then you ask them if they say, well, heaven. Then you ask them why and then let them answer. And they should, this is where you're going to find out if they really understood. They're going to say, well, because I prayed and asked the Lord to save me. You know, they're going to say it kind of in their own words. But that lets you know they have the understanding now. 
Um, so you're giving them uh, some more assurance. And then you can ask them this question. This is all part of step 12. Ask them this question. Do you think you'll ever sin again? What do you think you're going to hear there? Actually, you're going to hear probably more often than not, you're going to hear no. You'll hear yes. Some people are like, yeah, I know I'm going to sin again. But oftentimes, you're going to hear, well, no, I'm not going to sin again. Because they think they're saved and they're never going to sin. People have such unrealistic ideas as far as what a Christian is. They think a Christian is somebody who never sins. That's why people get fed up with hypocrites, because they know Christians sin. Well, we don't pretend not to sin. You know, we just we know we're still sinners. You know, we're just saved by God's grace. And we try not to sin. We try to live a life that pleases the Lord. But uh, so you ask them, do you think you'll ever sin again? And many times they're going to say no, but you're going to teach him what the Bible says and what to do when he does sin. So turn to 1 John chapter 1. Now this is going to seem like a lot of stuff here as you're giving assurance. And this is where I'm giving you way more material here than what you're probably going to use in real life. Because remember, you have to kind of gauge the time, how much time you have, how much time you're taking. Uh... But you want to be as thorough as you can with the time that you do have. So 1 John chapter 1, in verse number 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and, and his word is not in us. So, Oftentimes what I would do here is I'll do verse 8 and 9. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And I'll read verse 10 and then I'll go to verse 9. It's like, see, you're going to sin, but here's what you need to do when you do sin. Verse 9, if we confess our sin, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then you can use 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So you can use 1 John 2, 1 to teach them that we are God's child. And it is God's will for us to not sin. God doesn't want us to sin. Um, but if we do, the wonderful thing is... Jesus Christ is an advocate, or he's a lawyer pleading on our behalf. He's pleading our case to God Almighty. So that's a wonderful thing there. Um, now, let me ask you a question. Let's say you just finished step 11. You led somebody to the Lord. When is the best time to give somebody assurance of their salvation? That's what they say. As soon as they get saved. What about waiting until they have doubts? No. Why would you not wait until they have doubts? Because it's easier to prevent the doubts than it is to get rid of them. Well, that's true. Sometimes you wouldn't wait, though, until they have doubts. is because you're probably not going to be around when they start having doubts, are you? You're probably going to be long gone up the road or wherever you're back to your home. And they start having doubts. And then they're going to be like, oh, man, i got to get saved again. And they might not be in a church that's preaching and teaching the truth. So uh, they're going to probably struggle with this a little bit. So the best time to give assurance is immediately after salvation. When is the best time to get them to come to church and make a public decision? Make that decision public. Now, what would be... What would be a way to make a public? Okay, baptism is one way. What's another way to make a public? Coming forward. Just coming forward church. in church. Yeah, they can just come forward in church and make it public in church, and then you can deal with them uh, as far as baptism. So really the best time to get them to come to church and make it public is immediately. Now, let's say this is a Tuesday night, You've led somebody to the Lord. You want them to come to church to make it publicly. And usually Sunday morning is the easiest time to get them to come. 
Uh, and they say, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll do that. What do you think is going to happen between now and Sunday? Could it never change their mind? Why? The devil. The devil, the devil's going to be all after them. The devil doesn't like he just lost somebody. And he's going to be all over them. I mean, there's going to be all kinds of things happening between now and then. And so this is why we're going to, I'm going to give you some little pointers here, some things you can do uh, to help them follow through uh, with making a public commitment. Because when you make it public, it's kind of like nailing a stake down. You know, you've made a public, this is why uh, making a decision in church, you can make a decision in your pew, but it's, it means so much more going to the altar and just saying, Lord, I'm giving this to you. Because you, it's almost like you nailed a stake down. Here it is, God, I'm giving it to you. It's more of a visible thing uh, that you're doing. So tell him, this is what you're, you're dealing with him again. Tell him you're going to make a statement that he's going to not believe. And then say something like this. Now that you've accepted Christ, there's nothing you have to do to be a Christian. And at this point, you're going to use what's called the marriage illustration. So you're going to say, now that you've accepted Christ, there's nothing you have to do to be a Christian. Well, what is the marriage illustration? Well, the marriage illustration is, it's like, I'm going to say, you know, my wife, my wife and I are married. And, you know, my wife, she does a lot of things for me. She cooks my meals. She does my laundry. And sometimes my laundry magically gets into my drawers. Uh, sometimes I put them there. Uh, you know, she makes the bed. She does a lot of things. And I try to do some things, you know, there right now, but she does all kinds of stuff. What if she said, I'm doing all these things because I want to become his wife? Would that be a true statement? No. No. Why is she doing all these things? Because she wants to. Because she already is my wife. Does that make sense? You see, we don't do, and that's where you're going, once you give the marriage illustration, then you're going to correct this. You're going to say, somebody would say, well, I know why. You know, she's doing this laundry, cooking the meals, cleaning up after. She's doing all those things to become his wife. And you're going to explain that that's false. And then you're going to repeat that statement again. Say, now that you've accepted Christ, there's nothing you have to do to be a Christian. But there's much you need to do because you are a Christian. Jesus said, if you love me my commandments. So you're trying to teach them here that the reason we do things is not to keep our salvation. We're not trying to earn our salvation because we already are uh, we already are a Christian but we ought to be doing these things because we simply love Jesus. That should be the difference. Alright, we'll go ahead and uh, we just have about a minute left. Any questions on any of that? I want to just make a note here of the dates. Romans so, 13 13 we haven't gotten to yet. That's where we're going to stop. Any other questions on it? Oh, okay, we'll go ahead and take a break and we'll pick up here again in about five minutes.